put together a lecture that I titled Breathing for a Better Day. And that's what we'll be starting off with today. And after we get through about an hour of this, then the end of this lecture will be kind of an open question forum of low brass stuff. Now I'm happy to answer questions. I provided you a little like no must, no fuss handout for low brass quickie stuff that you might need as a band director. But we'll start off with breathing and all of that pedagogy there before I forget. I'm Dave Earl. You can forego the doctor. Your students can call me doctor, but you guys can please call me Dave Earl. That's not a problem at all. Each low brass here at UW Blackville. I'm a Wilson tuba artist, and I moved here from Arizona State University where I was finishing my doctorate a few years ago. What we're going to do today is talk about a number of exercises that stem from uh, the pedagogy of Arnold Jacobs, who was the former principal tubist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And we're also going to go through a number of pedagogies that have been adapted through what's called the Breathing Gym, which is a text and DVD that's available through Focus on Music. It's written and produced by Sam Palafian and Patrick Sheridan, uh, who I both studied with for quite a while while I was living in Arizona. So let's start off with this handout that's titled Breathing for a Better Man. The purpose of this, the goal for the next hour, is for me to give you the tools you need to make your band sound and play immensely better in five minute increments over a month. Within one month, if you do five minutes of this a day with your band, I promise your band will have immensely better tone, will have better technique in their ensemble, and will generally play better in tune as a result of that. So that's the goal. Beyond that, these exercises are designed to make playing your instrument easier and more fun, which will hopefully help with retention and with the general progress and development of your program. I want this to be super relaxed today, and if any of you have any questions at any point in time, or if I say a sentence way too fast because I got really excited, please tell me to repeat myself, because I often talk really fast when I get very excited. So please, feel free to ask questions at any point. Ask for points of clarification. If you've recently had a shoulder surgery or an arm surgery or a back surgery, you don't have to do some of the stretches. Please don't feel compelled to do so. Don't hurt yourself, because then I have to sign liability forms, and everyone's sad when that happens, especially me. So the first thing in this packet, the three golden rules I want you to remember all the time when we do any exercises, when you work with your band with these exercises in the future. Number one, always stay relaxed. I see a lot of tension developing in young players, because it's hard to play a brass instrument. It's hard to play a woodwind instrument, and tension ultimately kills tone. The goal is to stay ultimately relaxed with as little excess tension as is possible while you're working with your wind players. The second one is your goal when you're working with your band is to always immediately apply the benefit of the exercises to musical endeavors. So right away, as soon as you finish these exercises, have your kids play immediately. Today we don't have instruments with us, so we'll pretend that we would do that as soon as we finish this whole walkthrough of things. And then the third point that's really worthwhile, the third golden rule is don't be a hero. If you feel dizzy, stop and sit down and breathe through your nose. Don't fight through it and then black out and have us, like you wake up to us staring at you on the ground, <laughs> horrified. Don't, don't do that. High school kids love to challenge this rule. They love to be like, I'm gonna go as close to blacking out as I can. And then they forget that you can't like just put the brakes on. Once you've set this into motion, it's really easy to just go over the dark side and be gone and wake up. Hopefully not in a pool of vomit, but <laughs> potentially. <laughs> And that's too dark for anyone's band room. So those are the three golden rules. Again, number one, always stay relaxed. Always keep relaxation your number one goal. The best players are always relaxed when they play. It's a natural part of what we do. Second one, immediately apply these exercises to your band to get an immediate benefit that will last for a while and don't be a hero. So today we're going to discuss three different categories of exercises that we'll go through. And I like this order in particular. There are a couple little italicized notes I put in there. I like going from a stretch, which is anything that's designed to wake up your body and then get ready for the process or the endeavor of heavy breathing. The next category are called therapies. And if you buy the breathing gem, there's a number of other categories that fall beneath therapies, but I lump them all kind of into one group. These are endeavorous or like engaging exercises that make you work harder than you would need to when you play your instrument. So it's important to note that the air you use in a therapy is not the same air you use when you play your instrument. A lot of times people forget that and they try to approach their instruments with this really engaged and active and frustrated body and it's very frustrating as the instrument can cause a lot of long-term damage. So the therapies are overtraining. They're designed to make playing your horn easier because you've already done something that's harder 
than playing the instrument, those exercises. And then the last study, the last exercise category are called flow studies. And these emulate or imitate the exact type of air that we use when we play our instruments. Cool, so those three categories again are stretches, designed to loosen up your body, make it ready to breathe. Therapies, which are designed to incorporate a level of stress beyond what you would normally incorporate when you play your instrument. Helping us overtrain, ultimately making the flow studies and the playing of our instruments the easiest component. And that third category again is flow studies that are exact imitations of what we sound like and blow like and play like on our instruments. So the next question is, this is going to be this hour long lecture about, about breathing. How on earth in my band program am I going to be able to use an hour's worth of breathing exercises? Don't worry, you don't have to. Like I said in the beginning, five minute increments are all you need. A little bit will go a long way. If you go from one stretch to one therapy to one flow study, that'll have the same impact over the time that maybe a month of that repetitive exercise passage that doing an hour of this in our session will have in your benefit. That's the long-term idea here. So you don't have to dedicate 15 minutes of your rehearsal to the breathing gym. You don't have to dedicate half an hour a day to breathing exercises. It's great. I, I kind of just listed four ways that I like to see breathing exercises used with a band. The first one is the most logical and kind of the most obvious first choice, which is during the warm-up time, all the percussionists are getting set up, getting their equipment into place. It's a great time to have your kids get their breathing apparatus warmed up and ready to go. It can be a little bit long-winded, though. That's the problem. This time, is usually you want to be warming up on the horns right away. So I'm OK with skipping that if you guys are pressed for time. The next time that I think is the best opportunity for band directors and band programs that are crunched for time to use breathing gym exercises is while you're transitioning from one piece to another, especially if your percussion has a new setup that they have to go to. It's a perfect time. You don't have to waste two minutes waiting for the percussion to get set up. You can use two minutes and get a really effective and really broad-reaching tone improvement in your entire band with these exercises during that little window of time in between each transition. The next one, I do a lot of what are called seated therapies and seated flow studies, which are great for quick fixes in the band room. When you've got a problem either with kids making it through a phrase, kids kind of falling in pitch near the end of a long four or eight bar phrase, or if there's an intonation problem or a lot of front issues, there are exercises you can do while they're seated. It takes 30 seconds, and then you'll go back to rehearsing, and it'll sound immediately better. That's one of the best ways to do it as an interruption of rehearsal without making them stand up and do a bunch of extra exercises that will cause a long-term loss of time. And then the last one, my favorite opportunity, is when you're at a contest site in those tons of hurry up and wait times, like you'll have to run to your audition room or your warm up room and then you have to wait for five minutes in the hallway letting the instruments get cold and the kids get bored. This is a great way to keep them engaged without making a ton of noise. These exercises are a great way to get them warmed up and ready without having to actually have their horn on their face. Cool? So that's the four that I list. There are tons of other opportunities to use this Breathing for a Better Band opportunity. But those are the four that come to mind quickly for me. So. What we're going to do today is walk through these exercises in an interactive, kinesthetic way. So I'm going to take out my coat because I have to move my body a bunch. But let's all find ourselves a standing space that allows us to have about, about this much room. You can put your hands out. You can move forward and backward. I'm going to have to move just a little bit to the left so we can get the video. Oh, that's all right. No problem. So before we start stretching, there are about three bullet points that I want to bring out while we do these stretches. The first one is that almost all stretches start from a, a stance that's got a nice, comfortable shoulder width apart feet. So a nice, comfortable, supportive stance. The next one, the goal of every single stretch, always, is to reduce tension, to remove tension. If you find yourself getting more tense because of a stretch or you feel pain, stop and reevaluate what's happening. Make sure that you're performing this in a way that allows you to achieve a relaxed state, ultimately. And then the last little point is that while heavy breathing is not always required for a stretch, it can be beneficial. It can be beneficial to start incorporating the motion of breathing into these stretches with your band, especially if you're pressed for time. You can kind of multitask with these stretches. So the first stretch that I like to start off with when I work with a band is called a trunk twist. So you plant your feet about shoulder width apart, you raise your hands in front of you like this, and you begin twisting at the waist. If you've had back surgery, twist very gently. If you haven't, twist a little less gently. Your goal is to find a spot behind you and meet that with your eyes each time that you twist. What this stretch is doing is stretching out our torso and our upper back. 
After you've gotten a good kind of introduction to this stretch, go ahead and lift your arms way up high. Continue to stretch. You'll feel that it moves up between your shoulder blades. Great. Arms down low. Let them hang loose. Twist out your shoulders. Excellent. Roll it out and shake it out. Excellent. So, one area that we hold a lot of tension that I like to talk about is our shoulders. I didn't write this stretch in this, but one of the things I like to do when I'm stressed out or when I'm driving, like driving behind someone who's driving way too slow and I have to be places and it's really frustrating and you get kind of this anger that rises in your shoulders, I like to make sure that I go to opposite extremes to find a place of balance. So I'll often take my shoulders and get them as close to my ears as I can and then drop them again. And usually what I find happens is that my shoulders drop about a half an inch just from the residual anger and stress of the day, because of that slow driver or that traffic problem or those kids not showing up to class or whatever it might be. So let's all take our shoulders, get them as close to yours as you can, and then let them drop. Good. So the next stretch is called the shoulder stretch, which is not that stretch at all. You take your right arm, you're going to pull it across your chest thusly and hold it taut with your left hand. Now what's going to happen next, this is the first stretch that incorporates a heavy breathing component. So I want you to just take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, I want you to pull a little further with that arm. So the point of this stretch is not only to pull out your shoulders, take another deep breath in, pull a little further. It's also to simulate the motion that your chest makes when you take a deep breath. Take another deep breath in. You'll notice your arm lifts off. As you exhale and pull, you can pull it closer to your chest because your chest is now no longer full of air. Go ahead and roll that out, shake it out. Flip it around, same exact stretch. Deep breath in. Pull a little further as you exhale. Good. Deep breath in. Exhale. Pull a little further. Excellent. Deep breath in. Pull as far as you can, but don't dislocate your shoulder. Because I'm not trained in that business. Then roll it out, shake it out. Excellent. <coughs> so, the next stretch that I like to go to is something that stretches out our upper back and our mid lower back. So, take your right hand, grab that light right hand with your left, sorry, grab your right wrist with your left hand behind your back, and give it a nice tug to the left. I know there's a lot of directions. Right hand's going to the left with a nice tug. Take a deep breath in. Lean your head to the left. That's the direction that you're pulling. Good, good. Deep breath in. Let yourself lean to the left while keeping both feet on the floor. Good, good. Deep breath in. Lean a little bit lower. Good, deep breath in. A little lower yet. Good, deep breath in. Low as you can go. Roll up nice and slow. Roll it out, shake it out. Always make sure you're returning to a relaxed state. Flip this around, take your left arm behind your back, grab that left wrist with your right hand, give it a nice tug to the right. Deep breath in. Lean your head to the right. Good, deep breath in. Lean your body to the, lean the body to the right. Good, deep breath in. Lean a little lower. Good, keep your feet both on the floor, deep breath in. Lean a little lower yet. Good, deep breath in, low as you can go. Good, roll up nice and slow. Roll it out, shake it out. So, there are a number of other stretches that are worth talking about. In particular, trombonists deal with a lot of tension up in their forearms. So I like to talk about arm stretches often, um, because we ignore them a lot. My favorite exercises are complicated, but we'll start with some easy ones first. The first one, I want you to use your right hand to give someone an amazing high five. They did a great job. You did a great job, too. You're going to grab your index finger and your other fingers with the other hand, and you're going to pull this taut and bring it close to your body thusly. So you're going to keep it as close to your torso as you can. You're going to feel the tension mostly here, up in here where your, your I would guess, your, uh, what would that be called, the carpal tunnel stuff is, and bring it back out nice and slow as far as you can extend your arm. Go ahead, roll it out, shake it out, flip it around. Same exact stretch, left-handed high five. Pull it back taut. Keep it as close to your torso as you can as you descend. Good, good. Excellent. Keep that forearm straight, then bring it back out again. Excellent. Pull it out, shake it out. The inversion of this one is to stretch out these muscles. You have someone kiss your ring, pull the hand taut, and then you do the same exact stretch in. You'll feel it kind of in your elbow, in the muscles between your elbow and the top of your arm. Good, good. Bring it out nice and slow. Excellent. Roll it out, shake it out. Flip it around. Excellent. Bring that in nice and slow. If you feel pain at any point during this, it means one of two things. You're doing it wrong, or there's something going on that you might want to go talk to a doctor about. Some excess tension, some potential like 
uh, carpal tunnel business. Be very careful. If you feel a lot of pain doing stuff like that, it's time to go see somebody about the pain. The next stretch is my favorite, but everyone gets lost in this stretch, so don't worry. We're going to be fine. So it starts off the same imaginary high five. From there, we're going to take your palm and put it outwards. So you're facing away from your face. You're going to reach around with your left hand, and your palms will be together, and you're going to pull your right palm back. So again, hand up front, palm outwards, reaching around slowly with the left hand to grab your palm, and you're going to pull your right palm back. There we go. You're going to feel that stretch right up in here. I'm looking around close. You want to have your palm come a little. Your, your, there you go. And well, I'm going to come help. That's all right. So it comes up like this. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Close. So here's the kind of palms out like this. And then it's going to come back like this way. Yeah, yeah. Close. Got it. It's all right. So like this, and then you're going to pull so that the palm comes back. Oop, like, yeah, like this. And you're going to feel it up in here. All right. Excellent. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Excellent. So let that go because that's going to start hurting after a while, as you may have noticed. Flip it around. Left high five. Palm outwards, facing away from your face, and you're going to grab your index finger and pull that left palm so it's essentially moving like this in its final motion. Good. Good. Excellent. Roll it out. Shake it out. That's a bagpipe stretch of all things. If you would have, who would have thought you would have found that in a bagpipe book? The next one is a percussion stretch that I love. It stretches out those same muscles. You take two fists as far away from you as you can possibly manage, arms as straight as you can, put your fists together, and you roll your knuckles but you keep your arms out as far away from you as you possibly can. So arms as straight as you can. You'll feel it up in here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Roll it out. Shake it out. I love telling trombonists about these stretches because they get so much tension in both of their arms. It's a heavy thing in their left hand and all this motion in their right. Super helpful. Bassoonists, you have to have these enormous hands. It's horrifying. These are great for all kids, percussionists, through wind players, no matter what. Um, the next stretch is an upper back stretch and lower back stretch, and it's called the, ugh, I hate that stretch. That's what it's called. And so what we're going to do first and foremost is you take your right hand, give yourself a pat on the back. Now you're going to grab your right elbow with your left hand, and now you're starting to see why it's called the, ugh, I hate that stretch. And you're going to pull to the left, and you're going to bring your body with it. We'll keep it both feet on the floor. Deep breath in, and lean to the left. Ugh. Uh, deep breath in, lean a little further. Uh, yeah, deep breath in, a little further yet. Uh, I hate that stretch. Good. Roll it out, shake it out. Flip it around, left hand, give yourself a pat on the back. Grab that elbow, take a deep breath in, lean to the left. Or the right, I'm sorry, I lied. To the right, deep breath in, lean a little further. Good, deep breath in, lean as far as you can go. Good, roll up nice and slow. I love that stretch, but I also hate it. It's a, it's a complicated relationship that I have with the, oh, I hate that stretch. Um, the next one on the handout is a two-way stretch. We're going to do something for our necks. Necks are another place that we ignore a lot when we play our instruments. So what I want you to do, this is a very gentle stretch. I want you to take your dominant hand. For me, it's my right hand. So I'm going to go down behind my back, and I'm going to grab it with my non-dominant hand and pull straight down. So you're pulling down with your weaker hand. That's the goal. Now I want you to let your chin rest on your chest, and I want you to roll your head, keeping your ears as close to your shoulders as you possibly can while your shoulders are kind of pulled down taut. If you find a spot that's particularly tense, which is okay, that's just normal, breathe in that spot. Associate the process of rolling out that tension with becoming relaxed. One of my key mantras when I talk about breathing is that you want to associate the sensation of breathing with relaxation so that playing your instrument becomes more and more relaxed. Breathing becomes more and more relaxed. In this context, popping sounds are just fine, but tearing sounds are no good. <laughs> Excellent. Roll it out, shake it out. Make sure that you feel balanced. One of the goals as you do these stretches is to feel as though more and more of your weight is just being delivered to the floor through your feet. The balance of your, your skeleton is designed to make you feel weightless, which is awesome, especially for bigger peoples like myself. It's great when you can feel like you're balanced and it doesn't, doesn't feel like you're having to carry anything, anything around. The more balanced you get, the more light you'll feel, the easier it is to do these breathing and stretching exercises. The next one's called the two-way stretch. So this has got two components. 
The handout has them broken down into two. We're going to do both of them together. First and foremost, we're going to learn where our, where our hips are versus where our, our waist is. Everyone put your hands on your waist first. So that's where your belt is cinched, unless you're a thug, then it's down here. Up here is uh, where we're going to be talking about the waist. So this is not where we want to bend from. If we bend from right here and try to take a deep breath, we can't get any air, right? We're out of air. Because everything that moves and is supposed to move as you breathe is, is occupied with the business of, of, of moving. So what I want you to do is lift each of your legs and find the spot where your body is bending. It's going to be much lower than your waist. There's going to be actually a bone that's part of your femur you can feel moving around. So that's where we're going to bend from. Try bending from there. Just a second. Take a deep breath in. It's no problem, right? You can totally tank up. It's not a problem at all. But if you're trying to bend from the waist, it's really difficult. You can hear it change my voice even when I bend over like that versus when I bend over like this, which is no problem. So when we get to the last stage of this, we're going to bend from that spot, that lower spot where your hips are, not where your waist is, OK? So the first half of this stretch is called the two-way stretch. I want you to plant your feet very firmly in the ground, about shoulder width apart. I want you to reach as high as you possibly can. So now, the next step is that we'll take a deep breath in, and as we exhale, we want to plant our feet more firmly and reach even taller. Deep breath in, stretch a little taller. Good, deep breath in. Stretch taller as you exhale. One last deep breath. As tall as you can get. Good, now the next deep breath, we're going to flop and hang from our hips, okay? So you want to get as low as you can. Make sure your knees aren't locked. It's not, we're not trying to touch our toes. We're just trying to drop and hang. Deep breath in. And lean and hang from your hips. Good. Take a deep breath in. Drop a little bit lower. Good. Deep breath in. Drop a little lower. Let the weight of your head carry you down. Deep breath in. Drop a little lower yet. Good. Roll up nice and slow. Stay relaxed. Excellent. So this stretch, one of the things you'll notice while you're down in this, this bent over position, when you take a deep breath, your body will naturally want to lift up. It's because of the nature of how our viscera works. All these organs got to get out of the way when we take a deep breath. And so that's a very natural component. Don't be afraid of lifting up a tidge and then as you exhale, dropping a little bit further. That's a very natural part of how this all works. Um, and then the last stretch we're going to do, that, that's in the handout at least, it's called E to O. This is a mouth stretch. It's a tongue stretch. It's designed to get our mouths ready to go and play most wind instruments, with a few exceptions. Clarinets have a, a unique set that's totally different than what everyone else does, and that's okay. But what we're going to do is say the word key first and foremost. Say the word key for me. Key. key. Breathe through that shape for a second. So now I want you to envision what's happening to your tongue. That's the first step. Now we're going to say the word bow, like a bow and arrow. Oh. Now breathe through that shape. Good. So now we're going to go from that really tight, very high tongue positioned E shape down to that low, open, resonant shape. And what we're going to do is use very short breaths to make that motion happen. This is my favorite <coughs> stretch to use when kids are seated and having a hard time with tone. So what we're going to do, I'll do it once for you. I like to use the hands to help because the hands help us see what's going on inside of our mouth because we can't actually visualize very well the inside of our mouth. So this is going to be that tight, stretchy E shape and gradually opening up into a big O shape. So I'll show you once how it goes. That's the exercise, OK? Let's try that together. Big, tight, stretchy shape down to a big open O shape. Deep breath in. Good. So. Clarinets do it differently. They have to have that big E shape to play their instrument. Everybody else, though, pretty much, especially the brass, we need to have that tongue way down at the bottom. This is a great intervention exercise. I love using this before I play. I love using it when I'm working with a band, when they get kind of clenched because it's a hard passage. It's a great way to open back up their oral cavity, make sure that their throat is open and relaxed. It's a quick, fun, and easy way to approach this open, relaxed air and open, relaxed sound. We're going to come back to that exercise a lot. And as we approach the next category of, of exercises called therapies, we're going to use E to O a lot to reset and make sure that we're staying relaxed in our oral cavities. <coughs> so talking about therapies, that's all the stretches that we'll do today. Unless you guys have questions, comments, concerns about stretches yeah, so far. Yeah, they do that with their hands. I do. Okay. It helps because the thing that I always find as a brass player is that I don't know what's happening inside of my mouth. It's so hard to like perceive What's going on? It feels like a cave with a giant piece of flesh in the middle of it. And that's pretty much what it is. Um, and so this helps, I think, 
not only, it's a kinesthetic memory thing. It allows you to see like this is what it feels like and looks like in your mouth. It goes from this really tiny shape to an open one. So I usually have the kids do that along with me while I do the exercise. It's a great question. Any other questions on stretches so far? There's plenty of time at the end too for questions as well. The next thing we'll talk about are called therapies. So before we dig into therapies, I want to remind you, this is not the way we breathe on our instrument. It's overtraining us. It's using tools to make it easier to breathe. Don't use a therapy and then go straight to playing. Straight to playing from a therapy is a dangerous technique that tends to make kids use a lot of extraneous tension that they don't need and will help. It won't set them up for success if you go straight from a therapy. So um, the next big thing that What's, what's worth noting is that because these are a more strenuous set of exercises, they tend to overwork us, they tend to make us feel a little uptight. After every exercise, it's really important to take a deep breath and sigh and relax and get back to a relaxed state. You don't want to carry over any accidental tension from these exercises into your playing and into your work on the instrument later. Uh, the next big important step is that don't lock your knees during therapies. It's really easy to lock your knees and then suddenly pass out without any realization that it's happening. So keep your knees loose. Loosey-goosey is the general attitude that I have about therapies. And the last one is that this is the first area of exercises that are culprits of making people dizzy. Don't be a hero, okay? If you feel dizzy, have a seat, breathe through your nose. That's the first step. There are four stages of dizziness, in case you were curious. There are probably more, but there are four that I have documented. The first one is that you feel a little dizzy. That's the first stage. The second one manifests in one of two ways. You can either start to feel a tingle in your nose, your fingertips, your tongue, or you'll start to hear a sound, like a low buzzing sound. One of those two, or both, that's the second stage. If you hear that or feel that, you should have stopped when you got a little bit dizzy. You should sit down and breathe through your nose. The next stage manifests in two of, one of two ways, too. It's the third stage, which is called the black ring of death. You get this kind of black, horrifying <laughs> ring around your vision. Yeah, and then, or the, op the alternative is that the, like, shapes start to swim through your vision, like stars will come. Again, if you see that, you should have sat down before your ears were tingling and your, tin your fingertips were tingling. The last stage is just everything's gone and you wake up in three seconds and all of us are staring at you. That's the fourth stage of dizziness. So if you get past stage one, have a seat. Don't be a hero. It's not worth it. Okay? It's not, no one wins. No one wins until someone passes out in the breathing gym classes. Everyone loses. So, keep those in mind. Let's do E to O one more time, that, that stretch that opens up our mouth and throat. Deep breath in, and out. Good, remember that shape. We're gonna keep defaulting back to that shape throughout these exercises. The first exercise we're gonna do is called 5-15-5. It's a very simple name with a very complex meaning. So, 5, 15, 5, we breathe in together for five counts. You can subdivide them, you can use individual quarter notes, you can use all five counts to breathe in one big chunk, but you get as full as you comfortably can, as full as you feel comfortable getting. And then for the next 15 counts, without going and collapsing that air, we're gonna sip for 15 counts more. So you're gonna sip beyond comfortably full. If you feel pain, don't do that. Okay? So you've met your maximum reserve. Slow down and stay, take a step back. But sit for 15 counts and then the last five counts we'll exhale all of our air, take a deep breath to get relaxed again. Okay? Before therapies and before flow studies, I often like to start off with what I call deep cleansing breaths, where you fill up to about 80% of your lung capacity and then you get empty. I use this motion all the time, it helps me center. So this is the inhale and the exhale. Very good, deep breath in again. Good. Make sure your knees are nice and loose. Deep breath in again. Good. Now we're going to breathe in for five counts together. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and twelve. Deep breath in and out. Good. Always go back to that relaxed shape because at fifteen counts of sipping, can be a little stressful. Some people trigger dizziness with this exercise right away. Some people have no effect from it at all. So if you feel dizzy, it's you're not a wimp, I promise. It's just how you respond to this stimuli. Let's do that exercise one more time. One of the big things that kids do that you want to watch out for is that they'll take that five breaths in 
and then they'll go, huh! they'll, they'll put their glottis in place to like hold the air in like they're going to dive underwater. We don't need that. It's just a loose hold. And then suspend. And a little air might leak out. That's totally okay. The, that glottis business doesn't have a place in our natural breathing cycle. It's only used for compression and downward push. So, and suspend is our goal. Let's take a deep breath in. And out. Good. Deep breath in. And out. Good for five. And. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and good. Deep breath in and relax. Good. Check your shoulders to make sure they didn't get tight. Great. Excellent. The next exercise is so much fun. The kids will love it and they'll laugh at the name. It's called Leaky Chunks. And what you do with this one is you train the muscles. I should, I forgot to tell you. Sorry, 515.5 is designed to expand your vital capacity, your usable vital capacity. It helps you retrain what full feels like. You begin to understand, like, oh, that really wasn't full. I can go, I can go a little further than that. I can go, yeah, it's still from there, and have more air ready to be at my disposal without feeling uncomfortable with any pain. The next category of exercises, these leaky chunks in particular, are designed to train the muscles you use for breathing in and the muscles you use for pushing out. That's what all this is for. So. Leaky chunks are all about fighting for air and then pushing all of your, out, your air out. If any of you had asthma, it's similar. It simulates that horror. So don't worry. We're all going to be fine. No one's going to have any problems. So what we're going to start off doing is using the back of our palm, finding a fleshy spot and using that as a resistance. Like that. A loose, leaky seal. Everyone try that. Great. So that's the first step of the leaky chunks. That's where the leaky term comes from. So that first step of fighting for air We'll take you five counts. We're going to breathe in for five counts and get as full as we possibly can while we're fighting for air. At the end of it, you'll pop. You'll take two quick sips to make sure you're topped off. And then you'll get two big chunks out at the end. And then you'll blow until you can't blow anymore and you have to hiss. So these are training the muscles we use to bring air in and push air out. The bellows muscles of our lungs, if you will. They're kind of like intercostals of our ribs. Those muscles are what we're training, OK? Questions, comments, concerns? It is silly but it has a purpose. So take a deep breath in with me. Deep breath out. <coughs> Stay as relaxed as you can. This one incorporates tension. Deep breath in again. And down. Good, now one last deep breath in. Get as empty as you can. Fight for air for five counts. And <laughs> Sip, sip. Two big chunks. And uh, good. So, again, to clarify, you don't want to use this type of breathing when you play your instrument. It's important to remember that these therapies are overtraining, more work than playing our horns. If you play your horn like that, with that push, and with that, with that level of trying to suck air in, it will be counterproductive. It will incorporate a lot of tension you don't need. Let's try that again, going this time for six counts of suction, getting as full as you possibly can in those six counts. Deep breath in, all the way empty. For six. <laughs> sip, sip, two big chunks. Deep breath in. Good, use that deep breath <coughs> to return to our last place. Associate that process of with relaxation all the time. The next exercise is called in sip sip out push push. The exercise names are very simple, easy to remember, and they're in your handout, so everyone wins. Everyone wins. The next exercise is also about increasing your usable vital capacity. It uses some arm motions to help the kids keep track of what's going on. So you take a deep breath in, as much air as you can get in one count, and you sip twice against that fullness, and then you blow all your air out, and you push twice. That's in, sip, sip, out, push, push. Simple as that. The arm motion isn't essential to success, but it helps keep track of where you are in the process. It helps make kids aware of where you are. So let's all try that together once slowly. In, sip, and then out. Good. And so with this one, I have to repeat it back to back. Maybe 
four to ten times, depending on how you're feeling. This is another culprit of making you dizzy. If you feel dizzy, again, don't be a hero. Sit down, breathe through the day. Here's about the tempo that we're going to go. Right? So in, sip, sip, out, push, push, and. Everyone's okay? A little dizzy? That's all right. Have a seat. Breathe through the nose. It's going to be just fine. So the next exercise will also make people dizzy. It's called sumo breath. So this is the one where we don't have this standard stance. Don't be afraid. If you're dizzy, it's not a problem. Just breathe through the nose. It's going to go away. What's happening is that you hypo-oxygenated. You over-oxygenated. Or no, one of those things. You've given yourself too much oxygen. Your brain loves it but can't really handle the data that's happening right now. Sitting down, keeping your head low, breathing through your nose will help balance it out in no time flat. Great. The next exercise is called sumo breath. Kids also love. You plant your feet about sumo width apart. You start from here. This is the empty part of your lungs. And open here to your full size. And we get, we're going to fill up as much as we possibly can in one breath and get as empty as we possibly can in another breath at a pretty rapid tempo. About that tempo. And you're moving all of the air you possibly can. Each next breath and each next exhale, your goal is to get more full and more empty making the, the stretch or the therapy a better therapy with each other <coughs> tissue. We'll do, we'll do this only about, we'll do it five times back to back, because we might get dizzy and that's okay. Here we go. Deep breath in to cleanse. Deep breath out. Here's the tempo. And. Two more. Last one. Deep cleansing breath. Good. Breathe through your nose if you're dizzy. <coughs> out through the mouth. Good, good. You guys are doing great. And the last therapy that we'll talk about is called the body's natural breath. I saw this one from Dan Parentoni, who's a phenomenal tubist and a phenomenal teacher. This one makes us learn what our body does when it has to breathe. It forces us to breathe in the most effective way possible. So this stretch, we start from completely empty, all the way empty. This therapy starts from with no air, and then together out loud, we're going to we're going to count together to 20 before we're allowed to breathe back in. So after we get to 20, we get to take this enormous, like, cresting the water after you were drowning breath. And what you want to do is observe what happens. Observe where your tongue goes. Observe what happens in your throat. Observe what your soft palate does. Observe what your lips <coughs> do. Because your brain knows what to tell your body what to do. Somewhere along the path, when we decided we had to think about breathing, we got confused about the processes. Because our body has known how to breathe since literally the first second that we, that we existed. Knows how to go. We're good. We got that. We got it taken care of. We have other things to take care of, like eating and all that business. So, but then we went to middle school band, and we had, we learned that we have to breathe differently all of a sudden, and we learned a lot of bad habits. So we want to observe natural huge inhales. So let's try this together. Take a deep breath in. Wait, do I? I I thought I, 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 I talked way too fast. So we're gonna exhale all of our air. Together we'll count out loud from that empty place to twenty. Then we're gonna observe the breath we take in. Cool. Excellent. Deep breath in. And out. This one will make you tense. It's very normal. Deep breath in. And out. One last deep breath. All the way empty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Good. So. Someone describe what happened. What's different in your throat, mouth, area now than it was before? How does the throat feel? Let's start there. What happened in the throat? You definitely feel that cold air in the back. Yeah, you feel cold air. All of a sudden, everything got out of the way. And I don't like to talk about muscles and tension because that tends to get us to do stuff. What I like to think of is that all of a sudden the throat relaxed. It just was like, I have no business being in the middle of all this. We need to talk about air right now, said the brain to the throat. And then what happens at your tongue? Where's the tongue? Down. Yeah, down to the bottom, completely out of the way. Usually the tip of the tongue will rest right behind your lower gums. That's where it's going to hide. Because it wants to just let as much air get in as possible. 
What about your soft palate? That's that kind of floating part of flesh above your back of your throat. What's going on there? Yeah, lifts up out of the way like you were yawning. Exactly. Let's do the exercise one more time. I don't want to make kids do this back to back, but you guys are all adults responsible and capable of managing your dizziness. Take a deep breath in and out. Good. Stay relaxed. Deep breath in and out. One last deep breath and all the way empty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Good. That's the type of breath we want to take every time we play our instrument. That type of huge, relaxed, easy breath. That's the goal. So that's the default we want to set to. So that brings us to our next chapter, which are flow studies. Are there any questions about therapies before we dig in on the flow studies? Great. You guys are doing awesome. So the flow studies, again, these are designed to emulate exactly what it feels like to play our instrument. The same exact and deliverance of air that we have when we play a wind instrument of any kind. The first one that will, uh, I guess I should go through all the concepts that I've bulleted in this list. So these are the best finishing exercises for this series of stretches and therapies and flows because it brings you directly to the place where you need to be playing your horn from. It's perfect. It sets you up for success right away. Um, there are four parts of a, of a great breath that I want to bring to your attention. You can use during these flow studies to focus on. The first one is this relaxed, big, open O shape. It's all in your handouts as well. So this relaxed O oral shape. The second one you can focus on is the evenness of your inhale and the evenness of your exhale. So the even in and out is the next chapter. And the reason that we talk about this is that it's really easy for us to get into the habit of going like a, like a weirdly shaped breath before we play our instruments. It's easy for us to go at the last second to play. And that, that malformed breath is way too stressful, and life's way too short for so much stress. We want to make sure that when we take a deep breath, um, oh, I put the, this in the front place, even in the mouth. We want to make sure that we model our quick breathing off of our long, slow, relaxed breath. Whenever we take a quick, half of an eighth rest or a sixteenth rest or a quarter rest of breath, you want to make sure that your inhale is the same as your relaxed, slow, super easy breath. Um, the next category after this even in and out is to make sure that you're making your air constantly move. It's in constant motion. Um, so that constant motion is avoiding hiccups in the air or avoiding a presence or a pocket of like discomfort or getting too full too fast. We never want to have people going, we want our goal to be an immediate and full movement of breath at all times. The last chapter, the last thing to focus on in a great healthy breath is the turnaround of the breath. So changing from a, uh, an inhale to an outhale, an outhale, an exhale. <laughs> So I like to think of this motion of in to out as a circle. I never, a lot of people describe it as like a valve motion, but that to me seems way too clinical and way too aggressive. So I think of, that's what I approach my breath as. It's all part of a natural circle and a natural cycle that brings us back <coughs> to relaxed flows. And uh, a lot of times I encourage people to use the stretch E to O in between these exercises to bring us back to that big, open, relaxed O shape. Cool? Questions, comments, concerns so far? Each of these four points are great things to focus on while we're doing these exercises together. You can use them as a key to keep you focused on delivering yourself the best air you can get. So the first, the first flow study that I like to start off with is called the windmill. You start with your hands down like this. This is halfway full. This is all the way empty. This is halfway full. And this is all the way full. So we're going to take ourselves about six counts to fill us up as comfortably full as you can. Nice and slowly, really even. And then back out for six counts. After each of those counts, we're going to increase the number by one. So we'll start with six counts. We'll do it for seven counts in and out. Then eight counts in and out, nine, and then we'll stop at ten. Okay? Take a deep cleansing breath. In fact, let's do E to O before we start this, just to get that mouth shape back in the right place. Deep breath in. Deep breath in. 
And now, good. Now we're going to read it for six counts and out for six counts. This is empty. This is halfway full. This is all the way full. Keep it as smooth and even as you can. And. Seven. Eight. Deep breath in. And up. Good. So that's the base and beginning of the flow slip. Showing us how to move a lot of air in a really even, constant, and flowed way. The next exercise is what I like to call practical dynamics. It's where we assign a kinesthetic experience to the sensation of blowing air. So we're assigning a motion that we've done before in our lives to the process of going. The first one to start off with is starting in piano and pianissimo dynamics. I like to compare those dynamics in that air to throwing a paper airplane and keeping it aloft. So if you take a deep breath, and keep that airplane aloft in that breath, that's a great way to, to demonstrate to your students, this is the type of air you need to support soft playing. The next one, mezzo piano, or mezzo piano, mezzo forte dynamics, is like throwing a ball, or throwing a dart, depending on the instrument. Trumpets are a little more like throwing a dart. The low brass is more like throwing a ball. So this idea is you draw in the breath, so you a nice, a nice firm thrust of air that gives that enough pro propelment. That's the wrong word. Uh, uh, propels it far enough that it would make it across the room. Deep breath in. Good. So that's mezzo forte, mezzo piano, and then forte and fortissimo air. I compare to drawing a bow and firing an arrow. That same motion of a really heavy thrust that would deliver an arrow to your target, which is hopefully not an enemy, but might be in some contexts. So take a deep breath in. And you know, it's easy for us to assume the stance, but then we twist our neck a bunch. So what I'd like to pretend that we do is that we're, we're shooting the line. That's the goal. Yeah, it's very, very William Tell. So, deep breath in. Good, deep breath in. Good, that's the type of motion, that type of kinesthetic air we find behind delivering a fortissimo or a forte blast of air on, especially the brass instruments, but really on any of the instruments. At the end of the day, I think that honestly, about 80% to 90% of young wind players are under breathing. I think that generally speaking, they use what, we, what I call conversational breath, which is this breath that we're at right now in this moment of our life, this kind of atmospheric pressure, we're going to go a little bit under and a little over. I'll take a little tiny look and hope that it's going to be fine. These exercises are hoping to fix that. One of the big things that you'll discover as you do more of these flow studies and become more comfortable doing these studies is that empty is where we are at right now. Our lungs are effectively empty right now. We're at like the bottom 25% of our lung capacity. Everything above this will want to leave your body for free. It doesn't take any extra effort to get rid of that air. But when you get below that 25% mark, you got to push. you got to use your muscles to get the air out. So in these flow studies, staying relaxed is dependent on really tanking up and staying full above this neutral conversational air area. The next exercise is called monitored flow. A lot of drum courts call it the horror. I don't know why. I never knew the answer to this. But monitored flow allows us over time to check out what our, our wind is doing and how it's functioning. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll start off taking our index finger, forming that O shape, and a deep breath in. And what you'll hear is this big resonant low sound, like wind rushing through an oak forest, not a pine forest. That'd be like shh, an oak forest, like old hardwood. Deep breath in again. So that sound will be much louder in your head than it is around you. But what it helps you do is show that air is moving through your, the chamber of your oral cavity. When you have a big open cavity, it's not going to make sound, really. The lips are the only place that it meets resistance. This introduction of resistance 
causes your skull to resonate for you to, for you to hear that deep, <coughs> low sound. This helps us monitor that we're keeping a relaxed, big, open O shape and maintaining that through these exercises. The next step is monitoring your out, your exhalation. Use the palm of your hand, keep it right about here, and blow on your hand. That People use the back of their hands sometimes. I think that the front of our hand is way more sensitive in all reality. We have way more nerves there. And what you're doing is feeling the consistency of your air as it leaves your body. That's the goal. It should feel almost like you're washing your hands with really wimpy tap water. That's the goal. So those are the two monitoring tools that you have. And, and what we do next with this exercise is a long, stretched out version of different tempi of breathing in, or different durations of breathing in. I like to start with four counts in and four counts out, getting as comfortably full and as comfortably empty as you can. And then I usually expand it outwards, going to six counts, to eight counts, 12 counts, and 16 counts. From there, I'll go back down to four and do smaller counts. This one can make you dizzy. Be very careful. If you feel dizzy, sit down right away. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll set on a metronome right around 68 beats per minute. You guys all hear that? Is that okay? Great. So, once you get used to this motion, start thinking about these different four steps of a great healthy breath. Okay? Let's breathe in for four and out for four. Actually, let's do E to O first. Let's get ourselves set up for success. Deep breath in and out. Great. Let's read it for four and out for four. And six and six. Make sure your knees aren't locked. Make sure you're staying nice and relaxed. Eight and eight. As full as you did in 12 counts in these four. Great. Three and three. Two and two. Stay as relaxed as you can. Four and four. One and four. Have a seat. The last step, the last uh, flow study we'll do is what I like. I like to use this to really fix musicality and articulations in my ensemble. The last flow study can be done seated, it can be done standing, it can be done in the practice room, it can be done in the band room. It's called wind patterning. It's where you use your breath to model how you want to play your horn while playing. So let's say we had the rhythm, um, how about the, the rhythm from finale? Da, 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 that pattern. So da, 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 is the pattern that we'll be, we'll be using as a bass. And so if I was to win that in this, I would go. 
That's the passage. You want to really feel it on your palm. You want to feel the air moving. Let's say it's a nice forte, Finlandy. Uh, it's going to happen because we're playing Finlandy a moment. So let's take a deep breath in. This tempo. We'll take four counts to breathe in. Although, one, two. I'm oh, sorry. One, two. Yeah, let's try to get ourselves really close together. Kind of again is da 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 da. da. So I, if I were to guess, it'd be da 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 to a sixteen da 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 da. da. One more time. One. Good, excellent. And so you can hear just just by hearing the front of that, it was so close together. It's a quick and easy way to line up articulations with the band while also providing a rhythmic driven air pulse behind it. So again. These exercises come from The Breathing Gym, a publication by Focus on Music, written by Sam Palafian and Patrick Sheridan. And they also, they come from a lot of the pedagogy of Arnold Jacobs. And I don't own any rights to this information. It's all for you to use. It's all in this handbook. There's a little, little like, blurb at the bottom that says, if you want to find out more, if you want to get the DVD or the book about The Breathing Gym, it's right there for you to find. Are there any questions about these exercises and about using them in your band that you want to ask now? Before we move on to the low brass specific question time. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I have a whole bunch of skinny little girls who are like, eh, that's as much air as I can take. How do you how do you fix that? Oh, that's a great question. So the first step is to start with therapies, I think, to get them to really move a lot of air. And what this is a unique quality that you see in a in a bunch of skinny little girls, which is that they're afraid of letting their stomach go out because societally that's a huge deal. Let them understand that that's a natural biological part of breathing. Like, this is not where your air goes. This is where all your organs live, and it has to get out of the way for you to take a breath. And what happens a lot of times is we get like all we get very curt and proper about like holding that in and walking around with our life with all this tension just wrapped up in our in our bellies, which is sad. Life is way too short for that much stress, right? Like life is way too short to be so concerned about whether or not you can fit into a size two jean, right? For real. We don't have those problems in the tuba world. There has to be a force somewhere in our belt line, no matter what. So, <laughs> uh, what I would say is start with therapies, and, and I would I would sit down and talk to them and tell them like it's okay if this moves around. It's supposed to. It's a natural response to your lungs filling up. Because what's probably happening is they're clenching it down and not allowing it to move and getting really chesty yeah, with their breath, and letting their shoulders rise. And, and yeah, like okay, how do we fix that? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's about relaxation. They're holding back because of too much tension, probably from societal pressure to not look like you can take a big breath effectively. That's the core of it. So being aware that there's a societal norm to not do that, and they need to be aware that it's okay. No one's going to be staring. If, if someone's staring at your belly while you're playing flute, they're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> like, they're doing the wrong, they're doing the wrong thing. They're wrong, not the suit. You got a question next, Mark. I'll just say, you know, oftentimes when we talk about breathing, with, especially with younger kids, they overthink it, and that's when all that thinking so hard about uh -huh. expanding that the shoulders go up. And yeah, and, and this is a great point. This brings up one of the myths of breathing. Like a, a bunch of people say your shoulders should never move when you breathe. It's not quite like that. If you take a full breath in and I keep my shoulders relaxed, they will raise a little bit, but it's not going to be the, like none of that business. That doesn't help at all. That just, that's, that's like a dance move, you know. Um, <laughs> Clubbing music, I believe, is what the kids call it these days. Um, but, yeah, exactly. That this idea of shoulders raising is essential to breathing in. That's a really common misconception. And it, it's all about relaxation at the end of the day for me. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. You had said that you can use this during rehearsals or, you know, transition moments. Uh, what part of this are you, are you using the, the So if I, what I would suggest is, so instead of doing this whole packet back to back, which took us about an hour to get right. through, choose one stretch, or if they're seated already and they're pretty relaxed, then you can skip the stretch, one therapy and one flow. And really over time you'll, you'll discover like, okay, I want to get them to move way more air. This is a big corral section that we need to have dynamics in. Let's start with sumo breath, because that makes them move a bunch of air. And then you go into like a, a programmed, um, like, wind pattern study and then you're good to go that takes two minutes and you're set that's the and so it really depends on what you want to address if you know that they're not getting a big enough breath leaky chunks is a great way to get them set to to really get filled up really fast so it, it depends on the setting and you can usually do this in a two minute chunk while the percussion is setting up their new stuff that way no one loses any time that's a great question too yeah 
I think using the variety is a good thing. There, there, somebody I talked with for a long time, he was a big proponent of, of all of this. Uh -huh. And we would get to where we would do this one. And then after a while, if you don't vary it up, you get bored, the kids get bored, it turns mm -hmm. into this. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, I gotta move on, I can't monitor that. And exactly. It's just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. that, so. Absolutely, variety is the key. Use different different tricks to address problems as they come up. That's, that's my advice with all these exercises. And again, I guarantee you, Five-minute increments over one month, you'll see an absolute change in your band's sound. 